Welcome to the Agronomy and Farm Management Podcast. I'm Amanda. And I'm Elizabeth. Thanks for joining us today. Well, we wanted to do something a little bit fun with this podcast being released right before Thanksgiving. So we started thinking about, well, what were farming practices like back in 1621 when we had the first Thanksgiving. I mean, we've all heard the story year after year in school, but we haven't ever, in those stories, I should say, we hadn't dove into what exactly they had to do to produce that first Thanksgiving. Yeah, I don't know that I've really taken the time to consider how different it would have been when you step off that ship in a whole other world with no technology, very little experience, and growing food suddenly becomes critical to just surviving. Yeah, it's a lot when you really think about it. So us two millennials, or like I like to say, the Roundup Ready generation, um, you know, we're right in the middle of getting our e-fields trial information in and all the technology that we've used this past year to uh, implement those studies, reviewing that data, So it's been really fun to look back and think about we didn't, they didn't have that back then. They didn't have anything close to that. Um, What was it like to try to feed all of those people um, and do it within a year, basically, right? Because they they had just spent the winter on the ship and got off and had to produce enough food. Yeah. And now as Americans, we have a rich history in growing food. I think Thanksgiving as a holiday really is a testament to how important that is to our heritage. But for our ancestors, this was basic survival. And when you look back at the pilgrims, they didn't necessarily have the skills that we maybe take for granted today. Um, When you look at the folks who were on that ship, no one we could find on the list was listed as a farmer by trade. They were all tailors, servants, sailors, and other non-ag related trades. Um, hopefully they did some crash courses (laughs) with their local farmers before they set sail, because that seems like something that should have been at the forefront of their mind. But maybe it's like outsiders in ag today, they look at what we're doing and it it seems so easy um, Mm -hmm. that they took that for granted as well, but hopefully not. (laughs) Yeah. So let's dive into it a little bit. Of course, soil is a big factor in farming. We're We're all aware of that. We have our really productive fields and we have our other fields that are not so much. So we found an article from the Soil Science Society of America. Well, it talks about how the land in coastal Massachusetts, where they landed, is very shallow, stony, and sandy. So it doesn't sound very productive. And then compare that with some of the ground they had back home in southern England that was rich and loamy. And even if they had been in farming communities or had talked with farmers before they left, they were probably a little bit mystified as to how to grow food in those conditions. Yeah, they also didn't have livestock to help them work the ground like they would have had or seen back home. And I know Amanda and I both garden, (laughs) and just thinking about on that scale, um, trying to get our garden beds going when a lot of times they're a little more gravelly than the nice fields. You know, we all struggle And, you know, it's more of a hobby than trying to feed our families. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure we've all been in that place where it's like, oh, another rock. But this is over and over again and you're trying to feed your family. So as the story goes, they were aided by the, and apologies if I butcher this, (laughs) Wampanoag Native American tribe. And they shared their secrets for growing food in the region. They knew what would grow well and how to grow it. And that saved the lives of the pilgrims. Yeah, it's speculated that the pilgrims would have brought along seed from their homeland, and they probably would have tried to grow rye, barley, and wheat, as well as some of their English garden vegetables. We know that when we think about New England, um, the crops that come to mind aren't rye, barley, and wheat. So we're guessing it probably (laughs) didn't go so well for them that first summer. Yeah, so this is where the three sisters come in. This has been regaining a little bit of popularity, I think, among home gardeners. And if you haven't heard of the three sisters, they were likely part of the first Thanksgiving, and these are made up of corn, beans, and squash. 
So it's pretty cool when you think about it. The corn stalks provided the trellis for the beans to climb on. And of course, those beans may have even provided support for the corn because I'm sure stock quality wasn't what it is today. Um, but then as a legume, the beans also supply nitrogen to the corn. And this is kind of neat that the squash, of course, would cover the ground around it, providing weed suppression um, and some shade for water retention. But they also had spine varieties, maybe even more pronounced than what we have today. And that was able to deter like raccoons and deer and things like that to keep them from getting to the corn and the beans. That's a pretty good, good idea. We maybe need to start doing that yeah. again to <laughs> keep pests out of our fields today. So, and then sometimes there was a fourth sister we read about, such as sunflowers. Some reference were, references to it were used as pollinator driver, but also maybe a barrier around the fields to try to deter some of those pests that way too. The pilgrims probably wouldn't have survived much past that first summer and to that second winter if it wouldn't have been for the help of the Native Americans. Um, it's important to keep in mind that the seeds that they're sharing from these crops were selected and adapted to the area they were in. And the Native Americans have been able to select strongest plants from their environment, much mm -hmm. like modern day ag has yeah. done, to make sure that things are adapted and productive for our areas. And talking about how challenging of a spot this is, I think that would be more important than ever. Yeah. The pilgrims showed up all naive with seeds from another country that probably weren't at all ready to handle the pests and environment that they were going to encounter in the new world. Uh, this past year, I did a presentation on seed saving. And the research I did for that, it brought up an interesting point that I hadn't really thought about, where we have all these heirloom varieties, and there's been a resurgence in growing heirlooms. But the seeds that we're getting from the store aren't the same as what our grandparents may have grown where whether they were saving the seeds or they were getting them from a local source, those plants were grown in that environment and adapted to it and selected for it, where today, you know, you're, it could have been produced halfway across the country. So I guess I'm saying this to try not to get too frustrated when your heirloom tomatoes don't look as good as grannies, but it's the same concept that the pilgrims would have faced. Yeah, they always look delicious and shiny on those seed packets, and it seems like they die about halfway through the summer <laughs> when Blossom and Drought gets them at my house. Right. <laughs> I think one of the most fascinating things that we read about was how the Native Americans approached fertilizer. Again, go back to those soil conditions, being rocky and stony, not a lot of that high fertility soil as a medium to be growing crops in. Um, the Native Americans were quite advanced in how they approached making sure that nutrients were there for the crops. So they were using wood ash and, fer and fish as fertilizer. So if you're familiar with the history of potash, you know that wood ash is a good source of potassium. Would, and we know potassium is very important mm -hmm. for plant development and calcium, which can raise that soil pH. And then they would bury fish in the ground near the corn seed. And as that fish decomposed, it would release nutrients into the soil in the root zone. So pretty creative and <laughs> and obviously a little effective. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. I don't think our neighbors would appreciate if we started burying no, fish in our fields, though. No. <laughs> at least if it was buried, it might take away some of the smell. You can still buy fish fertilizer today. Yeah, you can. Uh, phenology is another area where the Native Americans would have had insight. If you imagine farming in a new land, you have no previous knowledge of. Of course, you don't know the weather patterns and they didn't have a weatherman back them to help them. It could be really challenging to know when to plant those different crops. And it, you think about Ohio, like this year, we had a really warm February, right? You remember that? Like I felt like I should have been gardening in February. And if this was my first season here, I may have done so because I didn't know any better. So if you start planting too early and you only have limited seed, that could be a really life ending decision if all your plants die. So the Native Americans had knowledge of when to plant corn, when to plant beans, that kind of thing. Um, they had experience with that phenology. And that's another unique thing I don't think we focus on too much in that history. Yeah, that's something you know, we talked about this as we were planning. That's a thought that never crossed my mind. 
I mean, they showed up yeah. right ahead of winter, not knowing that it was going to be as cold as it was going to be for months leading up to when they could even plant a first crop. Mm-hmm. So when we talk about that first Thanksgiving, you know, it's about a year they had already spent there. And you know, the things that you don't know, you don't know Yeah. in a situation like that. I, I can't even quite wrap my mind around the risks that they were taking in coming across the big pond like yeah. that. That's pretty astounding. Right, so from what we've read, uh, Native Americans began raising livestock around this time, the 17th century. That's really been what's cited as kind of the turning point. And a lot of it seemed like it was to appease the colonists. Um, they were more willing to accept the Native American communities who they saw becoming more like them. So they may have had some domesticated animals at this point, but at the beginning of the 17th century, there probably wasn't a lot. I thought that was an interesting piece, though. You know, they didn't necessarily want to domesticate animals on their own. It was more of the self-preservation, fitting in, relieving some of that pressure from the colonists uh, to take their land and things like that. Yeah, it also would help supplement the loss of the productive hunting grounds. All of a sudden, this increase in population, when for years going back, there was really a great environment for hunting, it really changes the dynamic. We know what it's like yeah. now. You get you get an area overhunted, and next thing you know, the tag limit goes down in those counties. And it would have been that on a grander scale back then. Yeah, and we have laws in place now to prevent that where they didn't back then. So a Modern Farmer article suggested that the protein would have looked very different at that first table. There might have been turkey, but definitely more wild game. So a variety of bird was probably served, most likely geese or swan. And then venison, one of Amanda's favorites, (laughs) would have been a centerpiece. And with them being so close to the ocean, you know, Massachusetts is known for their seafood. So even then, there was likely lobster and other seafood on the table, which, you know, I think I would enjoy, might add that to my Thanksgiving table this year. I know, we might have to reenact the first Thanksgiving. It's sounding better and better. (laughs) One thing that I'd never heard of uh, was that the Wampanoag, (laughs) I think I said it different the first time, they had actually just come out of what was referred to as the Great Dying There was an epidemic that had ravaged their community from 1616 to 1619, and it had killed a lot of people and severely weakened them. So when we think about that from the Native American standpoint, and then the pilgrims who lost a lot of people on the way over and that first winter, I think about half of the people had died by the time spring arrived. They really had a lot to deal with. They'd suffered a lot. And while they were probably kind of wary of each other, they were also trying to heal from this devastation on both sides. So I think that this harvest was a much needed break and a celebration for them to reconsider everything that they still had. Yeah, hopefully this has been as fun for you guys as it was for Amanda and I to, to look back and reflect on one, how much has changed and two, just how blessed we are as a nation which is the reason for this holiday, to reflect on what we're thankful for. Yeah, and I think looking at both the pilgrims and the Native Americans and the history that we see there, we see a lot of that in ourselves today still in rural America. So happy Thanksgiving. We can leak up some of these articles we read if you want to dive a little bit deeper into this and um, enjoy the food and family. Thanks for listening to the Agronomy and Farm Management Podcast. Join us again in two weeks for our next episode. Hey, podcast listeners, just a reminder to give us a like or subscribe so you know when we release new episodes. If you're enjoying the podcast, be sure to leave us a review also. We appreciate the comments.